We probably all have heard the expression, use the expression, don't judge a book by its cover. A reminder to us that you can't really judge what's going on inside someone by what's on the outside. Interestingly enough, that expression is fairly modern. It was used in the first time in a novel from 1944. So it's a fairly new expression as far as expressions go, but it, it communicates an old truth. Jesus tells us in John 7, 24, don't judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. That you can't always go what's on the outside. Don't judge and make snap judgments, we might say. Don't judge by the outside, but make righteous judgment, he says. And then God tells Samuel, and tells Samuel he's going to anoint the new king, and every son of Jesse that goes by is tall and strapping and God says, no, he's not the one until the last son comes by. David, God tells him, a man, the Lord doesn't see like man does. Man judges by the outside, but God looks at the heart. A reminder to us that we can't judge by appearances, but that's what we do. We do judge by appearances. Uh, just a little bit of research, and by research I mean Google, um, found a lot of studies that reinforce the idea that um, people that are attractive get a head start in our world. Now, again, this is by research. I don't have any personal experience with any of this. But did you know that attractive people make on average from 4 to 5% more in income than people that are deemed unattractive? And people that are attractive get waited on much quicker in restaurants. That's why when I go out to eat, I always take my wife with me so I'll get served. People that are attractive get called back on second job interviews. In fact, they even do better in court. We find the accused uh, attractive, you know, that sort of thing. And there's one study that shows that even babies respond better to people that are attractive than aren't. So yes, we do tend to almost instinctively uh, make appearance judgments. We look at the way someone looks, the way that someone presents themselves, and we respond differently. We know better than that. We, we know that differences on the outside don't really make a difference. We, we know that the kind of car a person drives or the neighborhood they live in or, or the, their ethnic origin, that doesn't have anything to do with the content of their character, but we tend to make value judgments sometimes. Let me give you a, an example. Years ago, and it's been years ago uh, uh, now, um, Tressa had a couple of college friends that visited us here at Denby. They were both tall, strapping, good-looking guys, but one had people just kind of flock around him. Everybody wanted to meet him. Everybody wanted to talk to him. They both looked like football players, but one of them was an NFL player. You don't really see those. You don't really have those walk through the door, and, and so he got a lot of attention. Now, if somebody would have asked us, are visitors uh, more valuable to us because they play in the NFL? Of course not. But we tend to sort of value the things that the world values. We could use some help regarding how we regard people. Reminder not to look on the outside. And that's what Paul is going to help us with this morning as we continue our series in 2 Corinthians that we're calling Power in Weakness. He's going to deal with how it is that we regard people. And he starts like this in our text, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Okay, so he says, we are going to regard people not anymore by the way that the world judges. Now, judging somebody by the car they drive or how much money they make or what part of the city they come or what nationality they are, what their ethnic origin are, the kind of things that sometimes people look to, that is a worldly point of view. 
Christ has renewed us through the gospel. We have been redeemed. We have been reconciled, as Paul's going to go on to say. And so because of that, we view people totally different. We don't value them based on the old ways that the world uses. You know, James warns uh, Christians, uh, somebody comes into church and they're dressed in fine clothes and they drove a real fancy chariot and they're obviously wealthy. You better not give them special attention while you shuffle the homeless guy off to the, to the back row or I guess in our way of looking, the front row. Those are usually the ones that we don't value all that much. Um, and treat them differently. You don't value things. You don't value people the way that the world does. And that's important because in the first century, it was kind of hard not to. People were very, very different in the first century. Paul says in Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. We see there was a world of difference between those groups in the first century. Jew and Gentile, the rabbis taught good Jews that the only reason that God made Gentiles is so that he would have fuel for hell. Um, and by the way, the Roman world was just as prejudiced against Jews as that. They had no use for, uh, for, for Jewish people. So, but Christ says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. The way we are to view people is not to see those distinctions, those differences that don't make a difference. Slave or free, those are radically different categories in the first century. One group saw other folks as uh, property, things to use and abuse as they cause they belong to me. Well, as the other group saw the first as oppressor, persecutor, the person that treats me as subhuman. But all are one in Christ Jesus. We cannot recognize any of those differences. And male and female, in, in the first century, it really was a man's world. Women were viewed more or less as property. Primarily, the, uh, they were owned by their fathers up until they were married, and then they were handed over ownership uh, to their husbands. We still sort of maintain part of that in our tradition, right? Um, part of the wedding ceremony. Who gives this woman in marriage? I do. So you hand the woman over. Christ says we don't look at people that way. All are one in Christ Jesus. Well, that wasn't just a problem in the first century world. We still see a, a radical difference between people. And Christ is telling us, you are a new creation. And because of that, the way that you regard other people must be radically and totally new. So we look at the world and we see all of those folks, you know, pouring over the borders to our south. Illegal aliens or undocumented uh, foreigners. Those are people created in the image of God. We don't view them as a political problem. We see them through the eyes. Those are people that Christ died for. We, we see you know, people fighting in Gaza. On, on one side, the Jewish people. On the other side, Palestinians. No, in God's view of things, they are people made in his image. And therefore, that's the way that we see them. Oh, those, those uh, you know, radical leftist wing nuts or the radical rightist wing, wing nuts that are dividing our country in this, in the politically, those are not political obstacles to deal with. Those are people created in the image of God. And that's the way that we must regard them. And that's the way we must regard each other. We do not see differences that make no difference because we are a new creation in Christ. So Paul continues, verse 18, all this is from God. This radical viewpoint, different ways of looking at people comes from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. We have this, uh, we like to look at ourselves as pretty good people, right? You know, we're not perfect, but we're a pretty good person. Um, well, yeah, we are compared to other people that we consider not to be so pretty good. 
But being a pretty good person is kind of like, that's pretty free of strychnine. You got a little bit in there and it kind of ruins the whole thing. None of us are pretty good people. Paul reminds us, quoting from the Old Testament in Romans 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Quotation from uh, one of the down uh, times in Israel's history, but it applies to all of us. No one is good, pretty good or otherwise. We only can see ourselves as good by being very careful who we compare ourselves to. I mean, if you've ever gone on a diet, you know that it's a lot easier just to hang around with big people than it is to actually lose weight. You can pair yourself carefully with other people and you can convince yourself, I'm a pretty good person. But compared to the God who calls us and the God who holds us accountable, we're not pretty good and we're never going to be pretty good by ourselves. So Paul says, all of this is from God. We're used to thinking in terms of, at least I grew up thinking in terms of steps. You go through a, you know, the steps of salvation, or you hear the gospel, and then you uh, believe, and, and then you uh, repent, and then you confess, and then you're baptized. It's almost you go through these things, and, and these steps, and you become good. Let me share you one of the, uh, a story that's not my finest hour. It's back in my youth minister days which is going back a long way. And um, I only remember this story because it very much wasn't my finest. Now, we had a young man that grew up in the church. I'd known him since he was a little kid. Uh, he um, had always been active in the youth group, very sharp guy, treated people with respect, uh, very much a, what we would call a pretty good person. In fact, a very good person. But he had never been baptized. And so as a young minister or young youth minister, uh, not, not long after coming to the church here, I decided I was going to try to change that. I was going to try to talk him into being baptized. And here was the way that I approached that. Dude, you're doing all the hard stuff already. You're always at church. You're always active. You know your Bible very well. Why don't you go ahead and go in all the way and be baptized, get that out of the way, and, and then everything will be fine. In other words, you're pretty good on your own. All you need is the membership card. That's not the good way to share the gospel with somebody, by the way. None of us are pretty good on our own. We can convince ourselves of that only by being very selective in the things we remember about ourselves. Our only hope is Christ alone, cornerstone. By the way, Lynn chose all of our songs to, today, and she could not have picked them better for this lesson than if I had it, you know, picked them out myself. Christ, in Christ alone, we're going to sing a little bit. My only hope is in what Jesus did for us at the cross. I am not good in, on, in my own. I'm only righteous because Christ's righteousness has been given to me. So Paul continues with this statement of the gospel itself. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him, Christ, who was perfect, who was without blemish. He made him become sin so that he could give me his righteousness, who will never have righteousness on my own. Isaiah tells us that our best deeds are nothing but filthy rags before the holy and just God but Christ took those filthy rags on himself. And he then wrapped me in his perfect robe of righteousness, the great exchange that takes place. We are only made righteous through the imputed righteousness of the Christ who died for us. The message translates this verse. God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. I think that puts it pretty well that God's righteousness comes to us because of what Christ did on the cross. Here's what um, Spurgeon said 
reflecting on that very verse that we just read. They who preach this truth, the truth of Christ's righteousness, preach the gospel in whatever else they may be mistaken. But they who preach not the atonement, whatever else they declare, have missed the soul and substance of the divine message. That's exactly right, isn't it? That, that this is at the very center of what the gospel is about. That in our helplessness, God acted and we're made holy because of it. Now, the, the Bible gives us several different ways, several pictures or analogies or metaphors to help us to understand this great exchange that takes place at the cross. And some of these pictures are, are a little bit different, have different nuances of meaning, and sometimes can even seem to be contradictory. Sometimes it's spoken of as an atonement, that an at one meant a sacrifice that makes us one. Or sometimes it's spoken of more in terms of identification, that at the cross, Jesus came and identified with us sinners, crucified between two sinners, and took upon himself the ultimate human uh, frailty in that he has died on the cross for us. Or sometimes it's referred to as satisfaction, that Christ satisfied the wrath of God brought upon us by sin. He took the punishment for us. Or sometimes it's redemption, the buying back of a prisoner of war or the freeing of a slave that we're redeemed by the blood of the lamb and then other times it's spoken of in terms of victory that Christ defeated the forces of Satan making a public spectacle of them as he died on the cross winning for us our eternal redemption now those aren't competing ideas. They're just different nuances. They're just examining what Jesus did at the cross from different angles. We don't have to pick one and, and downplay the other. These are all different ways of understanding that. And by the way, this is important. We don't have to understand all those nuances and differences. Because you see, if as some people seem to think, that you have to understand what happens at the atonement, what happens at the cross in the proper way, then that makes the power of the cross dependent upon human understanding. I'll be the first to admit, I'm never going to be able to fully understand what Jesus did at the cross in all of its greatness and grandeur. Every Sunday we sit and contemplate and share in and participate in that death on the cross, the blood and the bread, the, the body and the blood that redeems us. The whole point is Christ alone, cornerstone, that Jesus paid the debt that we will never be able to pay, that he redeems us, that through him we are reconciled to God. So go back to the verse that we began with. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. All of those different ways of, of looking at people and, and noticing the difference between people that, that are recognized by the world, they're not recognized by us. If anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come. And that's how we view people. The old is gone, the new is here. That means all of the differences that suffer, and there can be... A, I mean, we're not going to be blind and, and pretend like we're all the same. We're not. We recognize differences. If you've ever worshipped with Christians in a different country and realized that everybody is speaking in tongues except you, yeah, that kind of reinforces the difference that exists. But they're not a difference that makes a difference. Because of this new creation, we see people as either those that have accepted Christ, in which case... They are our brothers and sisters. Or those that have not yet accepted Christ, in which case we become the ambassadors. So in verse 20, Paul says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Yes, to those who believe in Christ and have given themselves to Christ, we are brothers and sisters together in the family of God. And for everyone else, we become the ambassadors. Our words and our lives become ways to attract people to this message of salvation. The question this morning 
as we sing this last song is, have you done that? Have you given yourself to Jesus? Have you really placed your faith in him? This verse that we've looked at, this section of the text that we've looked at, that talks about this great um, exchange that takes place. What a beautiful picture that is of the atonement. But you know what another great picture is of what Jesus did at the cross and how he gave his life for us and how we are called to give our lives for him is in the call to baptism. In baptism, we die to self just as Jesus died on the cross. We are buried in a watery grave just as Jesus was buried in the tomb. And we come up out of the water renewed, this new creation that Paul talks about. If you've not yet given your life to to Jesus in that way, then we challenge you to do that. While we sing this next song, if you have not yet made that decision for, for Jesus, then we encourage you to go to the back. Our elders will be there at the back and explain to them how we can help you, and and they will uh, take it from there. And if there's something that you're struggling with that you need prayers for, uh, then we encourage you as we sing this song to go to the back and tell our elders, and perhaps you can go with one of them down to the prayer room and, and spend some time in prayer. For the rest of us, let's, as we sing this last song, contemplate on the deep, abiding, eternal meaning as we sing in Christ alone. Let's stand and sing together.